Hello and welcome to this FAIN online event. I'm absolutely bloody delighted to be here with one of my favourite actresses and comedians, Dune McKeekin. Now I probably said that wrong. Almost right, you just said McKeekin and I would say McKeekin with a softer. Right, so a bit more of a Scottish inflection. A bit like Loch. Rather than my bloody Kentish Yeah, posh. rather Yuck. than your Kent K. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the thing, isn't it? I mean, you grew up in sort of Surrey, partly, and also Berkshire. It's quite hard to yes. take oneself out of that slightly sort of southern girl thing. Yes, especially when I then was landed at a school in Scotland and had to adopt a Scottish accent to sort of save my bacon, but yeah. Well, we'll move on to that, but mm. we're going to go from um, discussing your book, my Lady Part, which I have to say is the best title of the year, if not the decade. <laughs> Thank you. And did you um, have to sort of jettison any that were filthier along the line? Any titles that were more inappropriate? I had a few silly titles that involved my name, like Dune My Head In or Armageddon or Prima Duna, but um, quite rightly, my agent and uh, the lovely Joe Unwin and Canagate were like, mm, let's find something that's broader so I put it out to my book group <laughs> and uh, so it wasn't me that came up with that Brilliant. it just came through on a text and I was like yes that's it Fantastic. that's it yeah and you've arranged it I wonder at what point this sort of became the idea as a series of sort of casting calls for various female roles yeah and uh, I noticed quite a lot of them are things like hag crow sort of prostitute yeah there's, there's quite a lot more whore there than madonna yeah um, yeah does that sort of reflect your experience of your career and being an actress well there are the nice mum and the sort of you know there are some some more benign characters but not as many i've t i've tended to choose the more feisty yeah the desperate prostitute the cougar the yeah the hag the nag the bossy bitch you know all those kind of stereotypes and you say early on in the introduction what is not going to be in the book. Yeah. And I thought that was really clever because mm. you're sort of wrong footing your readership from the start. But this is not a typical showbiz memoir. I also didn't want people to be really disappointed. Well, by the time they read the intro, they've bought it, haven't they? So tough shit. But I never wanted to write an autobiography or a memoir. I started writing my story during lockdown because I found a whole load of diaries. As a, as a sort of exercise to keep myself sane whilst I was looking after my young daughter. Um, and uh, yeah, and then it's sort of, so I've never wanted to tell the, the, the sort of sitting on the sofa with Graham Norton, my, my Judy Dench anecdote or my, I've never really wanted to do the celebrity um, autobiography. So this is not really what people are going to expect perhaps. No, but you do really get into the nitty gritty and the bones of being a woman, particularly uh, in the comedy sort of genre, which has uh, traditionally been dominated by men. I mean, there's, there's quite a lot of um, rage at misogyny in this memoir. As April De Angelis calls it, a bracing dose of feminist ire, which I think is right. I mean, my mum said to me during my university years, I'm, I'm so sorry you're so angry. I mean, and you think, well, it's funny that some people are angry and some people are angry and then they stop being angry yeah. and then as soon as you get a mortgage you apparently are meant to move towards the right a bit more. I think I've just continually to move towards rage and the left as I've got older. Yeah it's great. Do you yeah. find that in this stage of life you can really harness your rage very usefully? Well I hope so, I hope so. I don't just want to be, um, I, I was very worried it was going to be a bit of a dry rant. I wanted there to, okay good. Um, in my, in my self-doubt, um, you know, the lake of self-doubt that we're all swimming about in, I just thought, oh, why have I, what's, what, what am I doing? Why? That, it's like tiny tales of misogyny, you know, but people are going to want to hear some funny stories too. No, it's very funny. It's a very juicy rant, I'd say. Okay. But maybe to give some indication of this, let's, let's go to the start because you, yeah. you start with the wild child and that's a casting call for a girl child, seven to nine, but she's a sort of escapologist. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the wild child was just me never wanting to be indoors, wanting to be outside, wanting to be covered in mud, wanting to be in water, wanting to be in nature. Mm. That's interesting. Um, hating school, 
hating power, the power dynamics of teacher, pupil, of bullies in the playground, yes. being very sort of hyper aware of, of, yeah, of bullying. I remember when my youngest sister turned up at the same primary school and I was at the top and she was at the bottom. I was ready, I was, I was ready to fight. And she just skipped down to the bars and pushed this guy off the thing and carried on, this boy. And I was like, wow, she's, she's so different to me. But maybe you've modelled to her that kind of resistance so she was able to be like that. I think I was pretty... I was very uh, hurt by people early on, I think, by, by people not being faithful or taking a toy or pushing you over. I remember being just hugely upset by those things. Whereas my sister was like, you know, get over it. There's one very distressing anecdote early on right in that chapter where you escape in playtime by going to the monkey bars and you're sort of swinging around upside down and suddenly this group of boys summon you over. Mm. And, and that must have been very difficult to write. What happens next? What happened was I was at, yes, I was at primary school and I was whizzing around on the bars over and over and over and yes, yeah, so probably my knickers were showing perhaps a, a flash of, of knickers. And anyway, then a little boy came down and said, oh, you know, can you come up to the top? And I was like, oh, friends, great. Mm -hmm. And uh, got up to the, to the circle of boys and they sort of surrounded me and, and said, pull your pants down. And, and I did it. And then they all started sort of sniggering and touching themselves. And I don't know how long I stood there. And then when I was released, I was sort of in shock. I sort of skipped down to the bars to show that I didn't care, but I didn't play on the bars ever again. I suppose that's the first. And that, you know, there's been a couple of other assaults which I didn't write in the book. Um, from doctors, actually. Um, so I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to sort of just make it about that. Mm. But that definitely triggered off an early thing of a distrust of. And, and I think those young boys, had they been exposed to pornography like our young boys have in playgrounds now? Probably not. I mean, maybe their dads had Playboy like our dad did or. But I just think, wow, isn't that incredible that in a culture they're so young and yet that seemed to be something they felt they could do as a group. I, I did relate to that story and I went to a you know, local primary school and I remember there was quite a lot of, you know, sort of aggressive kiss chase with extra elements thrown in, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, you didn't know that that kiss wouldn't involve tongues or someone wouldn't try and yeah. pull at your knickers. And, and I think you're mm. right, it was a much more sexualised culture. I'm not sure why. Really. Well, it was the 70s, late 60s, wasn't it? Mm. Um, so sex was just, women, sexualised women were kind of like much more on posters yeah. and perhaps in, uh, in, in portrayals on TV it's more Diana Rigg than, uh, than an empowered kind of, well though I would say she's sort of empowered but there was, she was definitely sexy wasn't she? Yeah and you know you talk a lot about page three and I remember in my parents pub in Kent there were those, do you remember that the, there were um, peanut stands you pulled a packet of peanuts off a bit of card and it and revealed a, yeah. a busty yeah. model Sam and Fox. naked yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah that campaign i mean that campaign was was extraordinary because we did win that campaign and at one point we went up to see stella creasy and we said how can we up the profile of this campaign it's just seen it's taking such a long time and we, we i got this breastplate built made by a friend of mine and we were all going to wear like naked breastplates <laughs> outside <laughs> and and then it, that sort of thought, oh, well, that's dangerous because then people are going to be seeing women with enormous tits. I said, yes, that's the point. But it didn't. Anyway, it did get, um, it did get, it worked. The, 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 the bare breasts were taken out of page three and um, that's wonderful. But yeah, we were in a much more, but you know, we think we're liberated now. And I think the Advertising Standards Authority is saying, oh, we've taken a lot of sexualized adverts from say London Transport for, from the tubes which we were all campaigning about in the 80s and you know mm. it's not unsexualized the, the advertising we have now pretty little things yes they're all women yeah. just literally sitting with their legs apart uh, it's very highly hyper sexualized I think more so you know, I look at my nieces and they're all lovely girls, but what they imitate in terms of pop songs and things on TikTok. And also how they pose for their Insta, yeah. <laughs> you know. also that thing with the finger in the mouth. We're always taking the mickey out of the woods. What, what would you think if me and your, you know, your mum were just like hands down our pants or 
Uh, like yeah, this. yeah. It's, it's quite weird. Yeah, it's 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 very worrying. It's it's upsetting to look at, isn't it? It, it is upsetting. Mm. So I'm not laughing about. It. I'm just thinking I'm going to take you back. Yeah. Go to your childhood. Yeah. That's clearly where your love of drama started. And I said, we don't learn that much about your family. I felt to me like you're protecting yeah. in a very nice way those who are close to you. But yeah. they, they're clearly quite eccentric. Yeah. I got that yeah. sense. Yeah. And you had a parrot and a goat yeah. growing up. Yeah. And lots of children staying with you. Yeah, yeah. We always lived in houses that were too big for us and couldn't quite afford. So, <laughs> so mum would just fill up the house with, with foreign students during the holidays whose rather rich parents didn't really want them. So they often were quite lonely sort of disenfranchised little kids with perfectly packed suitcases full of iron oh. but packed off to us for six weeks Blimey. you know um so it was kind of amazing to have this sort of gang of kids which then that that became our holidays was was yeah putting on making up shows and dressing up and and roving about rather wildly which was wonderful and you were in charge of them and kind of Bossy, probably yeah. sort of yeah yeah i was kind of directing and choreographing and being the lead <laughs> it was a good it was a good starting point and then you were uprooted so there's this kind of you know rather um conventional in some ways sort of southern thing and sunning down in Berkshire yeah and your parents suddenly go we're taking you to Fife I think my mum and dad had bought country life and used to look through it like property porn yeah and they found this this beautiful regency manse in the middle of nowhere in in Fife and they went to see it on a beautiful August day right. and it was 35 grand and it was like I was that was just like even in those days it was a lot more but the house they were living in was in the, the suburban green belt the commuter belt so they could they could afford it and mum thought great I can have all the animals I want I've got land and dad wanted to get back to his roots right. being from a Scottish family and so he ran a textile mill on lock off one of the locks and they just it was like a dream but as you see in the book it, it's it was brutal it was the house was freezing we could only put the heat on once a week we it was um it was a long way to school yeah. so it was traveling to and from the school on in the dark in the starlight yeah it was but but you know i feel how amazing they they took that leap and uh, i was 12 my brother was 11 and my little sister was five and it has given me an incredible feel for Scottish countryside, Scotland. That's definitely yeah. in my heart from having spent five years in that incredibly beautiful East Nuka Fife. Oh yeah, it's drop yeah. dead gorgeous. But it is interesting again, mm. all as children of the sort of 60s, 70s, you know, things like zero central heating and... No central heating, no, I mean... No, no screens. And we had a little yeah. tiny telly. We'd all cram into the, the, the only room that was warm with a gas heater in it and watch Stanley Baxter or Freddie Starr or, yeah, uh, you exactly. know. Um, but, you know, there were some long, brutal days of like the weather was so bad. There was a storm. What do you do? So I suppose it allowed us to have dream time and to become kind of my brother had a drum kit. I had a piano we just jammed all the time so he's now an amazing musician and yeah. i did quite a lot of sort of dreaming and writing and walking around with the, with all the animals who i loved yeah absolutely well i grew up in a sort of forest in the middle of nowhere so i yeah. totally totally relate to that yeah um so interestingly your parents sent your brother to a private school but as you say so and i think this is very typical mm. girls are seen as well, if there's going to be some money spent on private education at that time, it was the boys who had it allocated to them. And you went to a slightly more, um, well, now it would be like an academy or comprehensive yeah. in um, the St. Edges St. Andrews. Andrews yeah. Yeah. And that was quite daunting. Yeah. Yeah, my brother was sent as, as the future breadwinner to, to Dundee High, which I think was quite a posh school. Completely different direction to where I was. And I went to a, a state school on the outskirts of St. Andrews that was really quite rough in terms of like now the building's been condemned for asbestos i wonder why i've got a lung disease um but i was moved from that quite rough school to the nicer uh, school which was still part of the same school but they had two bits to it 
It's interesting. Um, did, did some girls get left behind? Was there a kind yeah, of segregation? Yeah, I think, that, I think there was a bit on. of streaming going on. God. And I was put in the bottom stream because they gave me a math test. So I was sort of floundering in this scary school. Um, and then I think someone realised I could speak fluent French or something and said, I think she should go on to the <laughs> other school. Or, oh, no, that's right. It was a creative writing. It was an English essay I did that was, yeah. yeah. But you were being taunted because your mum had given you some very warm bloomers to wear under your school skirt. <laughs> Sounds so like my mother. Yeah. And, um, yes. and you found there was a re one really effective way to get the bullies off you. It was quite a scary moment because it was, I was hiding quite a lot in the beginning mm. days to sort of keep away from everybody. It was, I mean, everybody was very feisty, very mm. loud, very sort of, and a lot of times I couldn't understand what people were saying either. Uh, yeah, so I was pulled round to the side of the school by a particularly feisty girl and my skirt was being pulled up, interesting, and going back to prime me, it was a bunch of girls this time, and they were looking at my bloomers, which were these, these thermal purple bloomers, which were like what your granny would wear, and, uh, and I was kind of being shoved and jostled and I thought, right, this, is, this better stop now. And I think I just burst into Basil Fawlty. No, stop it. I can't do the impression. It's so long since I've seen it. Stop it. No, this won't do. And, and they all sort of stopped and laughed and said, do that again. And then who else can you do? And I was like, well, then I was Manuel. And then I was quick. Who can I do? The Queen. And I just started doing impressions and made them laugh. And that's the classic thing of the, the clown who, who makes mm. people laugh and mm. stops the stops the bullying. But then I was able to join the drama group when I moved to the other school. And then everything was better because I played bitches, English bitches, <laughs> <laughs> and they love that. So anyone with an English accent who was a baddie, that was me. Yeah. And so then I became a bit of a hero because I was also able to take the piss out of being English. And by that point I'd adopted a sort of accent that could move between yeah. going home, speaking to mum and dad and friends, and then, yeah, the, the accent of school. So useful, I'm really saddled with this one voice and I hate it. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then, then you nip down uh, back to Surrey for your sixth form and um, mm. really re-engage with acting as well. So you're sort of beloved of the English department and all of that. But you said that you were um, sort of skiving off a bit, that you, were, you didn't flaky, I think is the word yeah. you use. I fell in love at 17 with a young uh, guitarist and I just thought of work. I just thought, oh... I just used to blag it. I used to do impressions of the teachers. I just made everybody laugh. I was glad to be back mm. in England, back in my home turf. I was really into sort of music. I was running away to see Led Zeppelin concerts in stolen Ford Capris. It was just quite wild. Um, and I remember them saying, uh, you, you should really do AS level English. You know, you should, mm. you are, you've got a gift. And, and, I, and gave me the wife of Bath, gave me Chaucer. And I remember thinking, oh, oh. Fuck this. what the fuck is this? I want to go and... I want to go to Blackbush and watch Pop Dylan and Tom Petty. You know, I just yes. did, wasn't, wasn't really engaged. And so did quite badly in my A-levels. Not badly, but I didn't get the results that I needed to get into Manchester Uni, which is where mm. I decided I wanted to mm. go. So I did turn up there and demand to be interviewed again and got in, thank goodness. That was a great lesson right there. It's really amazing, and I try and tell young people that, that if you really want something, yeah. go and tell the person in charge how passionate you are yes. about that thing. That's what we all want to hear. I know, I suppose because we're on email and uh, you, you know you can't turn up for anything without a pre-something, but in those days you, there, was a, there was a landline and letters. Mm. And I thought, no, 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 I'm going up there. And I just got on the train. My mum gave me the train fare. And I turned up at the drama department and everyone was busy and I said, I want to see the man who interviewed me. He said, well, he's directing in the, in the studio. I mean, you can go and knock on the door. And I knocked on the door and they were doing Hedda Gardner or something. <laughs> and everyone sort of looked at me like, what the fuck is this? And I went, it's, oh, it's George Taylor. I need, to, I need another interview. I, wa I, want to come, I want to come here. And he was like, oh, well, just, you know, it was a bit of a faff. And then it was yeah. like, no, 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 we can't do it. He's not available. Well, well someone else will interview you and then... And again, I blagged. I think he's, he asked me what was the last play I'd been to see, and it happened to be Galileo at the National, which I hadn't understood a word of. <laughs> and uh, he made some big question about how it, 
what were the implications with nuclear proliferation of nuclear weapons nowadays and I think I just blagged and I think he just must have thought right she's be she better come here well maybe thought I've got loads to teach her yeah you know? yeah but it's it was the start really of this sort of new version of you a more sort of militant radi radical version I mean you say your family after you went to Manchester started calling you Millie Taunt. Millie Taunt. Yeah. Millie Taunt was a, was a character from Viz. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So that was my nickname. Yeah, I think they all found it very... We'd never had a, a, a proper sort of political discussion around our family. I think in Scotland, we our, our, the joy of our mealtimes was we would record ourselves as a funny family, like we'd be very polite American family. If you could just press the butter, please do. And then we'd listen back and think it was the most hilarious thing. But we didn't really engage politically with what was going on or have intellect it wasn't really it wasn't like an intellectual it was a much more sort of earthy the parrot was taking the piss out of my dad's voice it was just a bit sort of it was different so i get mm. to manchester and i didn't i felt very overwhelmed in tutorials the way people were talking the language they were using i still have a feeling that i can't engage in discussions because i haven't got the right language um, I still don't quite know what intersectionality means, although I kind of do, but I don't know how to use it. Oh, that kind of thing. So at Manchester, everyone was having very interesting discussions, mm. but our professors, and uh, female and male, were very engaged. And, show, and we were going to see amazing plays, and we had a kind of great feminist studies film group, and it was in the 80s when there were lots of Reclaim the Night mm. marches, mm. and Greenham was happening, so it was yeah. very... It's a very exciting time and I was just kind of like lifted my head above the parapet and saw this this world that I knew nothing about so I was sort of very quickly politicized by Manchester and I'm hugely grateful I went there and not anywhere else. It made me very nostalgic for the 80s actually and I remember mm. similarly arriving at university and being handed you know a Faye Weldon book yeah. by a new friend I was like who is this? Brilliant. And it's like you know read lives and loves of a she-devil oh, and fantastic. it just changed the way you thought about everything and also you uh, know the poll tax riots all those yeah things. and that actually changing things you know being at the poll tax riot being charged by mm. those horses it was a really scary day mm. and I remember we would walk from Brixton and everyone was like we had this we had a great bunch of drummers behind us. So we thought we were the cool bit because we had whistles and drums and everyone was going, so, the poll tax, no poll tax. You know, we're so bad at marching in this country, aren't we? We need more. We need like a yeah. samba band. We're not the French, are we? We don't <laughs> yeah. set fire to tractors. And no, no. So it was a really amazing thing that then that, you know, it worked. So yeah. to be able to go on a march and see things change or write to the Advertising Standards Authority and get some of those adverts taken away out mm. of the tube was... Mm. Yeah, felt like we true. could actually make a difference whereas now i imagine some people young people may feel overwhelmed by how much well quite apart from the fact that they're trying to clamp down on protests and yeah. saying you know it has to be quiet yeah you know it has to, be, don't seem like to be as many don't do know. that there's not yeah. i mean well i think the police have more power to arrest now and, you and know. to move you off the main streets yeah. and down the back streets i remember going on a march how, i don't know like 10 years ago and we just ended up in a some sort of like cul-de-sac down the back you know we weren't yeah. where we needed to be yeah it's so that's hard and, and pressing your sign this petition button it just doesn't it can of course it can help mm. and of course the internet has done amazing things for getting people you know gathered together but yeah but sometimes yeah. it feels like you're pushing a button to sign a sort of petition rather than vocalizing all that anger and there's so it? much yeah. Like you've got to choose your battles and you got to go, I can't, you can't do everything. Of course you're overwhelmed and anxious because there's so much news mm. and people, uh, often people on set or at work are like this sort of rolling news. It doesn't help our minds to be able to deal mm. with the world if there's too much going on in our heads and it doesn't help us be good activists because we're overwhelmed. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Mm. But before we uh, start solving the problems of the world, which <laughs> I think we will eventually, <laughs> just going to say that if we take you back to Manchester, that's where you did your first stand-up, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, you signed up for an event. Yeah, yeah, I did my first ever sort of stand-up the, um, in the, the basement of the Union building um, at an all-women cabaret. Um, 
because I'd gone to the, I was quite lonely at uni. I was a bit like at the beginning, I thought, what am I doing here? I, just, I didn't, it's quite scary when it was just a bicycle and you and getting to know people. Yeah. Um, yeah, there was a board, a woman's board, and it said cabaret wanted, and there was not a single name on it. It just looked like a bit of a sad board. And the men's boards were all rugby, debate, rowing, running, you know. And I thought, oh, look, God, I'm going to put my name down because this is embarrassing to have this, this cabaret. And I was the only person that put her name down. So I just wrote some monologues and performed them with the circle of women, with the lights still flashing on and off at the disco. And it just unlocked something. I did a, um, a woman who takes her clothes off, and that young actress who takes her clothes off for a male director in the dark um, as she's trying to do her, her Shakespeare speech. Mm. So she's, you know... It would uh, never happen, of course. It would never happen. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, just a mix of characters. And anyway, it just ignited something. Mm. And that thought, I thought... And also, I wasn't getting any auditions. It was interesting. Mm. In the uni, there would be like, oh, Lope de Vega play... Um, directed by you know this up-and-coming you know young man who was everyone thought was great and I'd audition and I wouldn't get I wasn't getting in any of the plays and I was thinking what am I that, well I'm obviously not an actor am I I'm just right. so I think I found my little niche and then I turned that into a, 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 a sort of cabaret monologues and then when I left uni I started doing it on the circuit in the right. 80s down in, in London and started earning money from it but even mm. then you say in the book that you got told by sort of men on the circuit, oh, you're not really a comedian, you're more of a character actor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. Oh, yeah, I was totally like, you're not really, you're not, you're not really a, 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 com a, a comic, are you? Because you're, you're sort of an actress doing characters because characters weren't really, you know, if I had been Steve Coogan doing Alan Partridge on, yeah. you know, that maybe they wouldn't have said the same thing. But because I was doing characters and women were, the women, the only women around were like, Joe Brand, Jenny Eclair, and, and sort of one other or something. It was mm. very scarce. Um, and they were more talking about themselves. They were, they were talking in their own voices. Right. So I was seen as an imposter. It was just a way of knocking the wind out of my sails early, perhaps. I felt, reading it, there were a lot of moments in your book that reminded me of sort of similar experiences I had to walking into rooms full of men when you feel, I'm not really properly here. I'm just a sort of handmaiden to these people yeah. and uh, I think perhaps the one that's most striking is um, you go into a room and you've been called in by um, Armando Iannucci and it's uh, you know it's sort of Punt and Dennis and it's mm. David Baddiel, um, Rob Newman and you say they, there you are to rehearse they don't even sort of look up or say hello. I mean, that must have been a pretty horrible experience. That I mentioned that in the book because it was it was my first ever radio show, and Armando had seen me do some stand up, and I was incredibly excited mm. to be to be on. You know, it was my first sort of this is the next step up from stand up, and, uh, and I arrived at the Paris Studios, which used to be off Regent Street. Right. It's a big, big sort of or beautiful old auditorium. Right. Sad it's not there. And yeah, they were all just lying on the stage, you know, in, you know, day, about, and I'd had my script, so I'd seen some of the parts, and it was a rehearsal, and no one really got up or said hi, and I think I was really shocked. And then when we got into the rehearsals, again, it's all in the book, but I had to do a Sue Pollard impression. I didn't know Sue Pollard, I didn't really watch telly. And, um, and they said, well, she's kind of, you know, northern, and... So I did a kind of northern, I don't know, I just did a, a northern accent and, and Dave Baddiel's just said, that's, that's the worst Sue Pollard impression I've ever heard. And I just thought, oh my God, what am I doing here? And I just, I went off to Green Park and I just had a cry and I just thought, right, come on, you're just going to have to get through this evening and then you don't have to do radio anymore. Mm. You don't have to. But, but it was the beginning of being a woman in an all-male comedy group or a feed to a man. Yes. So it was the beginning of a long, long line of doing characters for in men's shows. Maybe explain that term, feed, because I don't think it's, uh, mm. if you're outside show business, you probably don't totally understand. I that. didn't understand what feed was. Uh, mm. I got, uh, again, I got employed in a, in a sort of sketch show on telly that was quite mm. ITV, quite mainstream, but it was sold to me as, well, yeah, there are, it is to launch the career of two men, um, <laughs> Peter Piper and Brian Connolly. But but um, but you've got some really nice juicy characters, uh, 
uh, yeah, sexy secretary and nagging mum and and I remember Peter Piper, we rehearsed a sketch and he went, oh, you, you know what you are, you're a really good feed. I thought, oh, what, what does that mean? It means that you're, you're, you're giving the line before the man delivers the, the punchline, which is the laugh. Right. Which is the feed line to the gag. Mm. You have to be set up and then, boom, ejaculation of the laugh. So yeah. it's interesting when we did Smack the Pony, we'd all been feeds yeah. in many different men's careers. And so we made the feed the funny one. We made the person who's about to, who's meant to be slightly off camera or the, the one that you don't really look at, we made that person center, which was joyful. And you jettisoned the idea of punchlines. Yeah, too, yeah, we didn't, didn't have punchlines, so we didn't have any endings to anything, sketches or anything. So that Smack the Pony did come out of that sort of trajectory, but you had proposed something similar about a year before and had been turned down. So you had this idea that an all woman sketch show just wasn't on the cards. Uh, I had pitched an all female sketch show and um, it had been turned down and it was to a female producer as well. So I was quite upset because I'd pitched loads of things throughout my, throughout the eighties. And that's another part of the book is that all the men that got there radio shows that then went on to be their TV shows and their TV pilots that then became, and also the failures. Like I think Frank Skinner had seven pilots that didn't work. <laughs> they just gave him more. <laughs> Whereas the women would go in and go, I've got this great idea for a, you know, I remember going in with Joe Brown and Jenny Clare and Maria McCurl and, and p pitching something for an all-female sketch show. And yeah, no, it was always, they had French and Saunders, so they didn't. Yeah, so we, we never got the breaks or the shows that um, that, that the men got. And Smack the Pony was quite serendipitous because you didn't at that stage know Sally, you didn't know Fiona. Didn't know Alan. Sally, didn't know Fiona. So yeah, I pitched this show a year ago. Then then Armando just said, said oh, we were at an awards and he said, oh, you, do you want to watch this this pilot? I think it's really good. One of the actresses has dropped out. Do you want to... Oh, I was like, oh, it's a female sketch show. That's annoying because, you yeah. know, I... And uh, yeah, and I watched, I watched it and um, I thought it was brilliant. And so luckily I said yes. I'm going to have to say that, that for me, that was the first time I had ever seen the sort of humour that I share with my women friends, the mm. sort of silliness, the sort of surreal daft things that we might say or do together. Mm. I had never seen that portrayed anywhere. No. So thank you. <gasps> Thank you <laughs> for giving us that because it felt like some sort of validation. Many women must have felt that. I don't think we'd ever seen women being silly. We decided to not do anything about sexual politics or chocolate or diets or periods or menopause or, you know, we just, we just decided to not do the women, what everyone would call women's comedy. So instead it's Sally sucking a glass onto her face <laughs> while her friend's telling her a story about a really sad story about a breakup and not being able to get it off. You know, that... Yeah. The stupidity of like, and also clowning, yes. physically being funny is something we hadn't been, we'd all been stuck behind desks or been strict teachers or been, you know, stupid tarts or, you know, I suppose we were, we would sit and talk for ages and ages before we would stand up and do impro. So we would, we would find out what had been yeah. happening in our lives. So we were really going into the truth of things and saying this really painful thing happened, but let's, let's put it on its feet and see what comes out of this. And that, so, it, so that paid off. We didn't have a massive group of writers. I think that's a, it was a very unusual fearlessness, both about the way you looked and presented if you were ungainly, but a sort of braveness about losing dignity. Yeah, too, and a braveness, about, a braveness about being not attractive. Yeah. Like playing some really strange looking people, or just a whole gallery of women. We're so used to seeing women being being sort of quaffed and presented and playing the stereotypes. Mm. Oh God, there's the nagging mum. Or there's the mental woman next door. Oh Christ, here comes the ball breaker. You know, but the, we were just we were just normal women in all their daftness, stupidity, and humanness that were allowed to take the floor. It is frustrating there hasn't been another series. And you say you've talked to people about it. I mean, what's your theory? why a sort of older version of Smack the Pony, which I would hugely welcome, I'm sure all my friends would. Why has that not happened? I think it may be well, how many years after it? You know, we all had busy lives and children and things happening within our lives, small tragedies and 
challenges and about after about 10 years and we remember we'd been together four years solidly mm. every day in yeah. a basement writing so we were like bye yeah. um, I need to do something else and we came back and said Leah what about you know an older smack um, and we did we, we came up with some great ideas we went back to our producer she agreed that the, and then I tried to pitch it and then it all just just nothing nobody uh, you're like that's extraordinary why didn't anybody bite and I think it's because we were older yeah I can't I remember going into one meeting and one of the execs kind of I don't know he just looked vaguely embarrassed one of the <laughs> and I thought oh my god it's we're not as pretty as we used to be he's not he's not seeing what what he saw yes, on the telly oh. well exactly but we why why isn't it why wasn't it picked up yeah. now I think it's too late I don't think Sally wants to do it everyone's involved in other projects yeah. but and also it's very hard to recreate something that's it's really like yeah. the second album thing yes it I is. mean we obviously we then talked about doing a live show but we all had small children it was yeah um, that's the culture well let's it? talk about children because this is a big uh, continued theme in the book is how bloody difficult it is to be a mother to be doing all the normal things that come with that breastfeeding having your children with you and working and we think we're living in a modern age with sort of crashes where the workplace will accommodate children but that hasn't necessarily been your experience well our, our profession so theater and film and tv don't really have crashes <laughs> i mean they're, 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 they're just not there so yeah. you have to either ask for more money to bring a nanny with you and to have some space and that's really hard they're like what well can't you leave them at home well no they're i'm breastfeeding yeah. this one and i want to bring my two-year-old with me so so there's quite a few stories about how difficult that was to make the children visible mm. and how what a fight that was to come with the children. I just turn up with the children. And you know, have that I, I need a room. Well, so, yes, and then sometimes they'd be like, oh, we didn't realise you, you actually were going to bring your children. Because I think women are sort of embarrassed. Of, yes. I, I, you know, here I am as my, here's my artist face. Quick kids, sick, you know, no sleep, shit. Like, keep that behind doors, you know, that needs to be brought to the forefront. It's really hard. You know, both, but you know, if you're in a couple, both both need the maternity leave, yeah. the paternity leave, the support. And I've heard um, terrifying stories about Hollywood actresses who really do hide their children and their pregnancies yeah. because if they are seen as being that person, they mm. think they won't get the parts. You know, they're yeah. automatically sort of excluded. Yes, exactly. Like there's something shameful about it. Um, I was lucky to perform pregnant twice with my first two in theatre. You but did I got fired, didn't you, on one of them and then got reinstated? Yes, at the National, I, I, I uh, let them know I was pregnant and I was fired. And then I found out that I had some rights and I, I snuck my way, well, I had a big fight. Um, I had to fire my agent. Mm. I had to take on the National and threaten to sue them. And I got to play the part in the end till I was seven months pregnant, which was wonderful. And people thought, in fact, that you had a cushion there because yeah. it seemed so right for the Yeah, part. she was a prostitute following the war in Mother Courage. It was deeply poignant to have this, this exhausted pregnant woman yeah. trying to turn a few tricks in the Hundred Years' War, like following a ragged bunch of carts. But it didn't suit the National because someone else had to be um, rehearsed in for the last six weeks because I said I didn't want to go beyond seven months. Um, you know, things like that. And I remember saying to the National, why don't you have a crash? Why isn't this? There's a lot of space here. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of technicians. We could get more female technicians on board. Mm. Um, you, can, you can support some of your actresses during rehearsals. They can actually see their children at lunchtime. You know, there's a recent BBC job I was on. And um, one of the costume women was told that her, her child was not even allowed to come into the car park. Bloody hell. So there we are. That's shocking. Yeah, she was technical I was lovey so it was like unless I brought that up like I could have brought my baby to the car park but just that that was somehow going to disrupt her her focus her it was going to make her a better person because she's seen her child at lunchtime I think sometimes weird health and safety rules because I tried to take one of mine you know, just to wait in the green room um, I think I was on some Radio 4 program Talking Head well I it, it was unbelievably difficult, complicated. No, we can't do it. We can't have a young person sitting there. And I thought, how can they be more difficult than, you know, some 80-year-old anarchist they might have on or something? Why, why is yeah. a small person yeah. 
so no very penalized like really should be unseen that's a terrible that's a terrible part of our culture that we don't yeah. let children in the car park mm. and this you is know? part of the rage in the book now i'm because time is limited on this and this is so much the emotional mm. part of your book i'm going to take us to the chapter which is the one that all readers will find uh, most harrowing and you know your life is moving forward you're a huge success I mean I should have said this at the beginning but you know your your career how you've won awards as a stand-up as an actress you know you, you've won it for them across the board and everything seems to be going really well and you've got three delightful children and then one Christmas things suddenly take a really dark turn yes um my beautiful nine-year-old boy uh, was looking very sort of pale and we were like oh well he's his toes swelled up and he's a footballer and we were like oh mm. he's just been kicking the ball too much and um took him back and forth from the doctors and they took him into hospital for a few checks and it was christmas eve and finally they let us home go go um back home on christmas day and we had a few days at home, but he was just looking very, yeah, he was just looking thin and ill, and we just thought, well, he's just got a virus. Anyway, the, the, the horrible truth was he had acute myeloid leukaemia. So, and he was two weeks from death. So this is the extraordinary thing, is that we were just sort of, so I look back and go, why didn't I see that he was that ill? Well, you, you just have a child that's got a bit thinner and gone a bit paler, but, so anyway, the long and short of it is I had a, I had an eight month old baby, a nine year old and a 10 year old girl. And we were in the Marsden pretty much for, we lived in the Marsden for six months on and off my husband and mm. I, uh, one night on one night off. And yes, I talk about it in the book because really it took two and a half years out of my life. Yeah. because then there was another year at home of, of recovery and we needed to both be there mm -hmm. uh, because he needed um, a nose tube he needed feeding through a nose tube he needed to rehabilitate after after the um, hideously strong amount of chemo that he had um, so and sadly that was a year later that was the end of my marriage because I think I think 80 percent of relationships fail in those kind mm -hmm. of high octane war zone Absolutely. environments we just couldn't support each other it was just and we had a baby so yeah that was quite a and i think was it two years later sort of post-traumatic stress and everything i thought i need to write about this i need to get this down for my son i want people to mm. know what he went through, what mm. he went through and I want it to be a lesson to people to go, wow, he was so brave. He, he, what he went through and how he didn't complain was just unbelievable. Mm. It's just astonishing how much he's the most amazing boy, but he's sort of seen too much death. I think there were seven children who died during that mm. time in the ward. So we all got to know them and then they suddenly weren't there. And I was trying to keep that from Louis. And then he was very upset that I hadn't told him about certain people he was very very cross you must tell me how molly is i go molly's all right molly's fine you know and i so that was extremely hard so yes that that sort of and then i the next job and obviously we had no money mm. but friends were incredible and friends helped me find funds you know there was a ralph richardson fund there was a theatrical fund there was help us pay our mortgage we got a we got a lot of we we were up, we, people helped us run our lives for a couple of years and then we were able to build a garden at the Marsden as well, which was amazing. But then the real is, here we are, Louis goes back to school and I've got to work and I'm a single mum. Yeah, and your father died. And my dad died. Yeah. And he says a point when they both got cancer and he yeah. called them Big Bear and Little Bear. Yeah. And, and actually, I, I was crying throughout that. You didn't tell us much about your father, but I have a real picture of him, and you do conjure him in oh, very few words. Rocky. I mean, he, he was ill with prostate cancer. He'd been ill for like eight years. And my mum, who's a brilliant sort of out there 
but we had him on a black grape diet, you know, had him on the getting off the wrong ley lines, making him, you know, <laughs> she was sort of very alternative before anyone else right. was. She kind of kept him alive, uh, uh, you know, longer than he could have been. Oh, bless you. <laughs> um, and I don't dare start because then I won't stop. Yeah. Um, he, was so, he was amazing. And of course, when Louis got ill, he was at the point of his cancer where they were pumping him full of steroids. Right. So he had this weird, this is, that's right, often if people are going to die, that's the kind of final bit before. Yes. That's their last, they just, that's the last chance give you your energy back, just let you get out of the house before he's finally in bed and can't get up. So that was, that was absolutely, so yeah, my heart was in pieces because I had my son, I had a new baby, I had a daughter I felt terribly worried about, who was just kind of forgotten in the middle. Yeah. It was all about the baby and Louis and my dad and, you know, so India has to be the one in the real world right. going into the playground and people saying, so is Louis, is he going to die? Just like, mm, just... People just don't know what to say. No. Uh, so yeah, my dad died um, just before we split up, actually. So yeah, it was a huge clusterfuck of hell, I suppose. You talk in the book about having post-traumatic stress disorder, but not realising. <coughs> and I just wanted to talk a bit about the play mm. Jumpy, because I saw you in it. Right. And I remember, I just didn't no obviously any of this and it was yeah. quite soon afterwards and i remember being absolutely transfixed by your performance Thank by you. the sort of frenzied energy of it there was something I, and i could not take my eyes off you and I, I walked away from that play thinking well and i think i reviewed it for the radio and, you, and for me this was the standout performance like this vortex and within the book this all makes sense because yeah. you're not only fizzing with all of this, but you didn't know you had pneumonia. You, were, you got so low. I mean, your life was mm. the, the post-Louis period of your life. You have to move house. Um, and then you've got teenagers. I mean, yeah. talk a bit about that because, you know, I've had traumatic time with teenagers. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, I mean, I didn't realise. Yeah, I don't think I paid attention to myself because I, there was no time. I did have a small child, little tiny you know mm. baby that was then became a one-year-old then a two-year-old yeah and then I had these two teenagers and that was probably the dark the dark times mm. because I was yeah I felt like a single mom there was a, a fair amount of toxicity with us trying to break up and money and how to mm. make it all work and rent both doomed to rental having to sell our houses they're both in rentals and the kids just being teenagers, just off, mm. just me going, well, where are you? And there's, you know, three, four o'clock in the morning, awake all night, them coming in, waking up my youngest one, mm. shouting, out of control, out of control. Being on the Xbox. That's Picking something. up the Xbox, smashing it on, mm. the, on the doorstep, losing, you know, shouting, them taking me into the garden when I had sort of bronchitis and saying, mum, we think you need to be on medication. Mm. And me kind of trying not to cry, but that being a real low point, like actually maybe I do need to be on medication, maybe I need to, I was a bit scared of myself, I was kind of out of control. Mm. Uh, and then that, that turned into pneumonia and then I was floored. Then I was in hospital and then that was me going okay. Well, I think a lot of women will relate that, I certainly did. Mm. And also because all that stress brought on a slightly early menopause. Yeah. And this menopausal energy, I mean, it makes you feel deranged, yeah. even if you haven't got that going on. Yeah. I, I find it pretty amazing, in fact, that you survived it, did as well. I mean, mm. what incredible performances. You should give yourself, you know, oh. huge congratulations and 10 medals for this. Well, I, I, the thing I learned about is that I was performing, I was, I was spiralling down into serious illness. And I was just taking antibiotics to keep going because I didn't want to let the theatre down because my agent was bringing Stephen Frears the next week, you know, some bollocks. I mean, who cares? Just, just come, pull out, mm. go to bed. But I got this thing of sort of driving my, mm. it's like all my foot soldiers were dead, but I was still at the top of the hill going, come on, you've got to, you've got to do it. There's no money. It's, mm. it's survival. I, well, how else am I going to live? So it was sort of, I had to keep going. I couldn't just go, oh, I've got, I can't pay the rent this month, so... But you did drive yourself into hospital. I drove myself into hospital. Yeah, I, I, 
I have a thing where I just, I have a lot of energy. So when it runs out, there's a, still a bit more energy in the mm. bottom. And then I'm on that energy and then it's like grinding <laughs> the gears. There's nothing <laughs> left, but keep going. But now I don't do that. So yeah, I have learned my lesson. I mean, it's important to say to readers of lots of lots and lots of lovely cheery bits. Yeah, there are funny bits, too. I know. <laughs> but um, actually, you know, that energy, it's also um, absolutely manifest in the chapter that you call Selkie, which is about swimming the channel. I mean, mm. honestly, that is another lunatic, lunatic thing to do, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. To get into the English channel. Yeah. Yeah. and swim it. I mean, how <laughs> mad are you? Just, just, just talk me through that <laughs> Well, process. it wasn't solo. It wasn't a solo swim. It was in a relay. And when I say that, people go, oh, oh, relay. And you go, yeah, it's still quite, quite a big thing. That, again, came about through complete... I was uh, adapting Jane Austen's Emma for the stage with a friend. Uh, I met this actress who I thought was perfect to audition. And she said, oh, I, I, you know, she's a proper English rose. She said, oh, I'd love to. It's just I'm swimming the channel on the 1st of August. <laughs> what? And I'd been reading a book about a woman who wanted to swim the channel. It was an amazing biography. And it was just a synchronistic moment where I thought, oh, I can raise some money somehow. Maybe I'll cross with them on the boat and I'll, I'll just raise the money so I can pay my actors because it was going to Edinburgh, my play. And, um, and then, of course, I start, I turn up at Tooting Lido one April morning and get in the water and, and just sort of do, start doing a bit of training with them. I'm not a big competitive swimmer. I'm not, a, I wasn't a fit, super fit person at all. But you can do proper crawl. But I can do crawl. I and I swim in the sea because being in Scotland, I used to swim with my dad. So, yeah, I love swimming. So I've always loved swimming. Yeah, I can do proper crawl. I'll teach you. Yeah, I can't do, I can't do the breathing. Yeah, I, just, I know. Yeah. That's what a lot of people say. But yeah. it's, yeah. So yeah, it, again, it happened not with that, I must swim the channel. It just, ha it just sort of, yeah. what happened is I trained with them and realized, wow, the cold water is really yeah. helping what's going on in my life. I'm feeling more able to cope with life and it's sort of clearing my head. And, um, and then one of the swimmers got ill and the, the guy who was the trainer, he said, you're, you're in. That's how it happened. Yeah, well, I think crazy, it's, but. It's just unbelievably <laughs> impressive. And uh, since we're sort of, you know, now squeezed on time, I just want to say, you know, you have moved into a space. I think it seems like you feel you have more agency. And maybe that's because you just don't bloody care what other people think. But you've made lots of decisions about things you won't do. For example, you're not going to sit there with some ar arrogant director mm. who pretends they don't know your work as they're going, oh, will you, um, will you just read this part? I mean, you strongly feel you know and like my work or you don't so don't sort of play power games with me yeah I, that was a particular audition that I had for a comedy show that um, I just thought I can't I, I'm not going to do this anymore I'm not going to be filmed I'm not going to be talked down to I'm just going I'm just going to leave mm. and I'm not going to audition for comedy anymore because I have a track record and if mm. you want me I'll come and meet you but that's not the same for, for the sort of drama or film like I've just been sent something where you've got to self-tape and I hate doing that. So I've said no. But then you, 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 you risk not working. So a lot of people have to self-tape. But it's harder. You have, to, you have to set a room up like this. You've got to film yourself. Yeah. You've got to learn the lines. It's a huge, it's a huge operation. And I'm, I think I would rather focus on, on either someone meeting me and going, I love your work. I want you yeah. to do this. But that doesn't always happen. I have auditioned for things, and, um, but just not comedy. I was just thinking that um, one of the things I really loved in that book too is where you talk, I mean, you're not at all judgmental about other people getting their tweakments and having things done, no. but you have absolutely made the decision that you are going to have the face that you were born with and very beautiful it is too. And you. You know, I find it such a relief because mm. I feel all the time in the media that when I see other people, I sort of think, but you look sort of, yeah, sort of ironed out in a way that my face just isn't. And mm. it, it is odd because, honestly, I don't find it beautiful. I do prefer yeah. people's faces to have character. Yes, yeah, so do I. So do I prefer to see a woman. But we don't see many older faces on screen. Mm. I remember in Scotland, because I film in Glasgow every year, they have a lot more older women on the news and the weather. I'm like, wow, this is brilliant. Why, why haven't we got this? Yeah. Why do we just have the perfect dewy face and the, the nice bouncy hair and the... 
yeah. the heels and the plump or, lips. Yeah, or the plump lips. So yeah, but that's that's a chapter I'm. My, I remember my um, editor saying, "Oh, you're gonna, you know, people are people are feminists. They're allowed to do what they like to their faces." And I thought, yes, yes, they are. But we must think about the legacy we're leaving to the younger generation. Mm. You know, we are the mentors. We are. If we don't touch our faces, th- my daughters will never have plastic surgery, or they not. But that took a quite a lot of. They wanted to have one of their friends wanted to have lipo, then the other one wanted to have. You know, there's a lot that they can yeah. have, and there's a lot that they're doing younger and younger and younger. So I do think we have got responsibility I to totally be proud of our faces. No, I totally agree. And to be honest about age and all these things, you know, the age you actually are. Yeah, and say your things. age and yeah, yeah, yeah. As much as you can. In fact, I try and talk about the menopause as much as any conversation I can put it into. Yeah, yeah. Especially with men. Yeah. <laughs> God. <laughs> oh, Christ. <laughs> yeah. Off again. <laughs> yeah, I know, but I sort of no, feel no. like it's got to be, it's got to be out there. Mm. So the book takes us right round uh, in the end to you go from a wild child owning a parrot to crow at the end as a sort of oh, nice, yes. maybe cause, because we're <laughs> nearing the distance. Why was that the sort of leaving point? Well, that's funny. I'd never thought of like the wild child with a parrot and then the last... I remember talking to a friend going, I don't know how to end the book. I don't, uh, it goes kind of from like the wild child to the hag. So it's all the parts in between. So it's like, yeah, Lolita, you know, get your tits out to, could you put your top back on please? By the time (laughs) you get to being the hag. No. Actually, we haven't talked about, I think we should really, should just quickly talk about something that I felt so passionate about too. Mm -hmm. The fact that there's this weird sort of, Porn in TV, I'm going to call it violence porn. So women being raped and murdered and out on slabs for light entertainment in mm. normal drama. You've really campaigned against that, haven't you? The idea that that in a casting, that woman, be she a detective, be she a victim, that there's going to be unnecessary nudity and sort of gratuitous inclusion of sort of horrible sexual violence against yeah. women. Yeah. Yeah, that's my that's my big bugbear. Um, I wrote an art- I, I was asked for the help by How the Light Gets In to do a speech about anything that I felt mm. angry about. And I wrote this speech called Enough is Enough about kind of what I call crime porn, about um, sla- women on slabs, about just the, just the casual violence, just women being pulled downstairs by her hair or smacked across the face. or It was about that and it kind of went viral. And then I made a documentary for, for B- for Radio 4 called um, Body Count Rising about this issue of what are we watching and how that's informing a violent culture. Mm. And I think women have to think about it too Mm. because actually often the audience and say the readership of violent crime novels involving you know degradation of women are women. We sort of feed off the fear. I I remember talking to a journalist who said oh gosh I really thought she said I sit and watch these things and I feel profoundly awful at the end of them. She said so I stopped watching one and I watched them (laughs) I watched a documentary about squirrels instead <laughs> of watching, you know, her Scandi, yeah. you know, uh, and she said it was quite funny that it happened to be about squirrels. There's not a lot, there's not a lot of other content. I just want us to tell some other stories. Yeah. I want to hear about other stories about women being damaged and hurt and victims are on a slab. I yeah. mean, you know, hard bitten detectives are parts I'm always sent, you know, she's, she's a hard, she's been around the block a few times. She might have a bit of a drink. She's a tough, tough. You go, well, I don't really want to be in a crime drama. Is there, why can't I be a pirate or a, you know, or a, someone who's circumnavigated the globe or a mountain climb? It's just we're, we're obsessed with mm. crime. Mm. I love a thriller. I can't watch, I can virtually watch nothing because I have a complete mm. zero tolerance policy on any violence. So mm. I'll be watching something going, oh, I really hope this is good because I'm really quite enjoying it. And then, yeah, bang. I still watch things like this. I feel like I can't. Yeah, but I don't want to watch. I don't want to watch stuff that's going to. I think it just really undermines our confidence as to just we are victims. Mm. What was what was um, so the man who murdered Sarah Everard? Remind me of his awful name. Oh God, was he a Wayne? <gasps> I can't remember. Wayne Cousins was it? I'm gonna have to cut this bit out. Do you remember the guy who murdered Sarah Everard? person hiding behind the desk she's probably fallen asleep i think he was maybe was wayne. it wayne cousins anyway so i don't yeah i'm i'm trouble i'm such a rubbish journalist i'm so bad with names doesn't matter the man who murdered sarah everard what was he watching 
Yeah. That's interesting. What was he watching? There's a lot of crime porn on TV. Yeah. Um, where men think it's okay to just sort of casually slap someone across the face or push them or I just think we really have to be careful and guard our stories rather more mm. carefully and just have a bit of a uh, think more carefully about what putting women at the centre that aren't that aren't yeah victims. I just really want to thank you for this wonderful memoir full of passion but sort of really good rage to me it was really useful productive rage made you feel like an avenger ah diana rig thank you yeah. oh yeah. thank you so much that really means a lot i i want it to be yeah quite kind of a bit of a clarion call definitely it's galvanizing mm. it's fantastic and um i should really say this is my favorite book of the year without a doubt <laughs> well, so, so um thank you yeah so, much. so go and buy it but thank you so much dune thank you very much you're the best interviewer ever yay <laughs> Wow, you've stayed right on time. <laughs>